Welcome to GovCast, connecting with federal IT's top decision makers. I'm Alexander Bolivar, production lead at GovCIO Media and Research. With me today is staff writer researcher Anastasia Obis. Hi, Anastasia. Hey, Alex. So you had the opportunity to chat with Alexis Bunnell, CIO and director of the Digital Capabilities Directorate at the Air Force Research Laboratory. How'd it go? It went great. Alexis just joined the Air Force, and she actually has two jobs. So she is the Air Force Research Laboratory's first chief information officer, and she's also the director of the lab's new digital capabilities directorate. And I really wanted to learn what this new directorate is about. Yeah. So tell me about this new directorate, what it's about, what kind of tech they're using to make it work. Yeah. So the Air Force Research Lab, it's the main scientific research and development center for the Air Force. There is a lot of innovation happening there. And this new digital capabilities directorate, it's supposed to streamline the scientific research and business operations through various types of technologies. This is supposed to bring researchers, scientists, key stakeholders together. And the goal is basically just being able to execute this process that involves so many parties more efficiently and get that tech out of the lab and into the hands of the warfighters more quickly. And what kind of tech are they using to, I guess, move the tech? <laughs> yeah. So let me actually elaborate a little bit on the goals uh, that they are trying to achieve. So the four goals are faster research, better decisions, streamlined transitions, and low friction business and operations. And like I mentioned, they are looking at different tech to achieve those goals. Uh, the first one would be data marketplace that would address that need to have the right information at the right time that we always talk about. They are also looking at cross-domain solutions and multi-level security. It's basically when scientists need to move data from disconnected lab equipment, isolated networks, and across different security domains. It's also supposed to create this worldwide research collaboration environments, and it will empower collaboration worldwide. There is also based investment planning capability that would ensure that something that they're working on within the lab makes it out of the lab. And the last one is the hybrid multi-cloud IT architecture. And it's basically creating that infrastructure that will make all of this possible. Well, it sounds like there is a lot going on. So let's not wait any longer. Let's take a listen to your conversation. Alexis, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks so much for having me. You recently joined the Air Force Research Laboratory as its first chief information officer, and you're the director of the lab's new digital capabilities directorate. How's it going so far? Well, as you pointed out, I didn't probably realize I was signing up for two jobs, but what an amazing two jobs for sure. Incredible honor. I mean, I think, you know, from the first one being AFRL's first central CIO uh, reporting to General Kane, really the focus there is on the larger digital dominance strategy, right? And the second, you know, is the director of the digital capabilities directorate, which is really charged with making that digital dominance and effectiveness a reality. And I think for me, what's really special about this is is not only working with AFRL, but because AFRL supports both the Air Force and the Space Force mission, it's kind of a twofer, right? I get to, in essence, feel like I'm having the opportunity to contribute to two kind of national security missions at once. And that's, you know, that's just a really exciting place to be. And, and most importantly, you know, the people are just incredible, so smart, so committed, and being able to kind of take a role in a moment of time where there's lots of questions about technology, right, and, and, and where digital should contribute is, is a really neat challenge, but I, I am very open about telling people that, you know, this, this role is really terrifying, but that's okay. I don't take jobs that don't terrify me anymore, and uh, this one is, is certainly, you know, going to give me a run for my money to make a difference. Yeah, absolutely. And before we dive into all of this and the new directory, I wanted to talk a little bit about you and your career trajectory. 
So could you share how you got to your current role and how your career prepared you for this position? Yeah, I mean, I, I like to think that I've probably never been prepared for any role that I have. For those of you that are out there that, you know, that want to know how to perfectly make yourself ready for the next thing, it'll probably never happen. But for me, I can definitely say looking back, there is a wonderful kind of stacking or culmination of my experience that made me more confident, right, to take this on. So, and in some ways it feels like a perfect circle. Um, I started way back in the 90s helping private sector navigate kind of bricks to clicks, helping organizations understand what this thing the internet was. Uh, one of my friends joked that I've been in tech and innovation longer than most people have had emails. And at first I thought no. And then I was like, oh no, that's probably true. Um, then I got to spend 10 years in war zones and emergencies deployed with the UN to places like Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and others. And so really, you know, was side by side with war fighters and in, in the middle of conflict. And so developed, of course, an amazing empathy and appreciation for, you know, what it is not only to be a warfighter, but our national security mission. Then I got to join USAID, the federal agency, as their head of knowledge management and transformation and uh, co-found their science research, tech and innovation lab and finished my time there as their chief innovation officer. So, of course, coming to a lab like AFRL feels like, OK, you know, I've, I've done this. I've done this part before, you know, as well. And then finally, most recently, spending almost three years at Google as their emerging technology evangelist for, for public sector and for DOD. So you can imagine that this role feels, you know, I couldn't look back in hindsight and say, well, of course I should do this. And then I should do this. They were all amazing, wonderful, you know, uh, challenges, but now it does feel like a, an, a really interesting culmination of, I think, helping organizations adapt, empowering the warfighter, catalyzing kind of scientific exploration and outcome, and then finally really leading digital transformation. So um, I don't know, wish me luck, Anastasia. We'll see, you know, we'll see what, what I'm able to contribute. So this digital capabilities directorate, it's very new. So what was the impetus for its establishment? Uh, what's the Air Force's vision for it? And what capabilities does it deliver? So I think, you know, from a capabilities deliver and vision, you know, we're just at a fundamentally different time in history. You know, even if we look back just a few years ago, the types of technology, the types of challenges that we're facing, you know, the speed in which we and the adversary really have to adapt and and move is, is just unprecedented. And so the Digital Capabilities Directorate is really the Air Force Research Laboratory's premier organization for digitally transforming how business is conducted through both the scientific side and the business side. And so what we're really trying to do is accelerate the transformation. And really what that means is how do we do faster research? How do we make better decisions? How do we streamline those transitions and make sure those discoveries have the impact they need to as quickly as possible? And then finally, quite frankly, and it might not be sexy, but it's so important, how do we reduce the friction in the way that not only we operate, but in what our people experience every day so that they're spending more time in that incredible discovery and advancing our mission and less time kind of through toil and the things that really aren't fulfilling our mission as quickly or as rapidly as it could. Um, part of what we look to do with that is really to deliver new capability to the warfighter. Again, as I like to say, at the speed of dominance, right? We, we need to stay ahead. We need to stay in a dominant position. And that means, you know, really enhancing our technical and investment decision processing. That means connecting and working with our peers, collaborators, stakeholders, advancing, you know, again, the acquisition process and ultimately executing more, more efficient, efficiently. And that kind of, as I mentioned, we've got those four key goals, right? So if you keep in mind, faster research, better decisions, streamline transitions and reducing toil, in order to do those things, we really recognized that we needed to kind of have five foundational IT capabilities, right? At some point, this has to come back to technology and, and you know, the, the technology we bring to bear. And so really we look at that, you know, hitting those four goals by looking at kind of five types of, of technology. So the first is, you know, a data marketplace or our approach to data, right information at the right time. The second is we are in, in DOD, right? So being able to address cross-domain solutions, multi-level security is really critical. 
A third is that that idea that we can't do it alone, right? So worldwide research collaboration, creating not just the human connection, but the environments. The fourth is making sure we're making the best decisions, that we're asking ourselves what if, that we're staying in that proactive space versus that reactive space. And we call this capability-based investment planning. And then finally, you got to have a plan for all of this, right? And you've got to have a plan that meets, you know, the technology of the moment. So there we're asking ourselves, what is hybrid multi-cloud look like? What do high performance compute look like? And those are really the five things that we think if we bring them to bear well, we're in essence going to be architecting AFRL to balance alignment, autonomy, automation, and agility across our people, processes, and technology. I know I haven't given you enough buzzwords. Um, you know, I can always add in more, but those are really what we're trying to do. Yeah, and can we stay on this topic for a second and dive a little deeper into that topic of capabilities? So what's the directorate's approach and how it will work to deliver those capabilities? And what are you seeing as of right now? What are some of the challenges to how you have to work through this when it comes to delivering the capabilities to the laboratory? Oh, goodness. I'm going to try to keep this short and sweet, but what a what a rich question. Um, yeah. I mean, I think so. So first of all, when we think about data, what, what we're really saying, or at least for me, what I'm excited about is how do I unleash people's curiosity, right? How is it that I lower, you know, the toil and the team thinks about how we might, for example, bring the query to the data? not the data to the query. Um, how do we set a portability mandate, right? I think one of the things that many of us who have been in IT for a while know now, it might not be about how easy it is to get the data in, it's actually how hard it is to get it out, right? Or mm -hmm. looking at things like interoperability. And so, you know, with that, we're gonna be looking at things like how do we decouple data from the tools, right? How do we make sure the data is accessible um, and independent of the tool? Um, regardless of kind of what we've used to generate, analyze, or visualize. And that's really critical totally. because our goal is to keep that data living through that, you know, and accessible through that transformation journey, right? So from the moment, you know, there's a first concept or first basic research, that same data needs to live on all the way to when something might be deployed or sustained. And so that idea of, of information life cycle and journey is really important to us. You know, as part of that, we have what we call Delve, which is a a data marketplace that's going to connect our research data, you know, to different research enclaves, uh, be able to connect isolated networks, unisolated networks, and really to make, again, the right information available at the right time. And we're excited about tools like APIs and others to be able to kind of create that living circulatory system, if you will. So, you know, and that's, you know, Anastasia, that's just data, right? If we get into, mm -hmm. you know, cross-domain solutions or multi-level security, you know, the reality is, is that our people have to work at all levels of classification. And you can imagine that in the research process, there might be something that starts and classified, but as it starts to get, you know, more advanced, more critical and having the type of impact we envision for it, it has to be able to meet the classification level, right? And the person needs to be able to have a relationship with knowledge at that level. And so this is a really interesting challenge and we're partnering with our information and our sensors directorates and that's one of the best things of the job is because I'm not the only smart tech brain, right? That's not my job. My job is to be able to work with our incredible researchers and other leaders. And many times there's a certain, another um, lab with an AFRL that may actually have designed, right? A solution. And, and sometimes the, the easy thing for me is to be able to see it and say, that's amazing. That really solves this thing. Now let's scale it. Now let's make it more available. So, you know, you can imagine the challenges around that. And we're really lucky as well to have um, not just, you know, kind of normal network and access, but actually high performance computing at all classification levels as well, which is so critical when we want to be able to, you know, move into kind of modeling simulation and asking those what if questions. You know, the third category you know, is this idea of research collaboration. And if there's one thing I can tell you for certainty uh, or with certainty, it is that research is not 
like how it's portrayed in the movies, right? Discoveries are not made by a single genius kind of meditating on a chalkboard, you know, kind of before shouting Eureka, you know, from penicillin to plastics, a vast number of transformative discoveries are a combination of teams of clever people, repeated failures, hard work, luck, and most importantly, great, great relationships with knowledge. And so, Mm -hmm. you know, as you can imagine for us, we don't want to limit our knowledge, our permeability, our collaboration just to the incredible minds we have within AFRL, right? So really looking to say, well, what does technology allow us to do, you know, to be able to partner with academia, with private sector, with researchers and with allies, right, around the world. And so that was a really, really critical for us to be able to just make it easier, right, to be curious together and to discover together. And then, Oh, goodness, there's so many more capability based planning. Again, that's a lot about being able to lean in, being able to kind of ask what if run scenarios. I'm a big believer that we have to be in a position to out curious, right, our adversaries and and be more curious than they are. And, you know, curiosity is really a relationship with knowledge. And so really being able to lean in. And then finally, again, kind of bringing that all together in a structure that makes sense. You know, that is really where the multi-cloud architecture, having these architecture and standards that are not um, time capsules, right? They're not stuck in this moment that we design them in a way where they're flexible, right? And they can meet the incredible technology that I haven't even heard of yet, right? But will probably exist in, in six months or eight months from now. So that idea of being able in every part of this to be adaptable and to be able to meet that moment is um, is part of why, you know, this is such an exciting role, but it's also terrifying because what you and I talk about today, there's going to be things, you know, that, that I haven't even heard of that we've got to start bringing into play just a few months from now, right? And that's, I think, the exciting part of this job and being at a place like AFRL, but also like, wow, you know, there's there's never going to be, a, I think, an end to the fire hose of, of what I should know and what's out there. Yeah, never at all moment. <laughs> no, exactly. <laughs> and when it comes to the strategic goals, how do you envision the process of supporting those four strategic goals over the next five years, I believe? And what are some of the metrics by which you will measure success when it comes to achieving those goals? Yeah, so you can imagine that there are overarching things that we'll be looking at and then I'll be looking at and overarching metrics. And then there's really specific ones, right, within each of those goals. So, you know, obviously it's very easy for us to say, well, we have more CPUs, right, or we're, we're dealing in more gigabytes. Um, but I think, you know, measures of improvement will also be really qualitative. I think on the quantitative side, you know, we just doubled our high-performance compute capacity, which is going to be critical to especially to pursuing tools like AI. Um, but, you know, as you know, it's prob- it's not enough simply, it isn't enough simply to have data, you actually have to use the data, right? And so I'm really excited about how being able to use API dev portals will really actually help us understand what data is most useful. Um, And even consider flipping the script a little bit on IT budgeting to incentivize people for having great data and making it available, right? So I think you'll have metrics, you'll also have incentives. I think Another thing that I'm really passionate about, even though it sounds not very exciting, is to run toil models. And that has been really intentional to understand what does our current process, the way our people work, or what they have to navigate mean as far as getting to the outcome we want. And then really asking ourselves, well, what does digital bring to it? Sometimes digital may not speed something up too much, right? It might not be the right choice, but a toil model really lets us understand where might we be losing time? Where are we losing people's sense of purpose, right? And and maybe things that could be, um, the bureaucracy could be reduced or we could advance something. And so what I love about toil calculations is when you do them really well, the decision on what you should do, whether you should digitize something or not, how much you should pay to do that becomes really clear. And I think toil models are probably one of, and toil calculations are one of the the least used, but most effective, um, you know, things to help really think about that type of transformation and impact. You know, obviously cost is really critical, but 
-hmm. If you looked at any one of these areas, so let's say data marketplace, you know, I'm going to ask basic metrics. I'm going to say, well, how many data sets do we have in the marketplace? Who's accessing them? You know, how often, how many data transactions or exchanges are happening, right? How, how curious are people being? How quickly are they getting that? You know, and of course, we'll be looking at things like, you know, avoidance of data breaches and, and you know, making sure we ward off security incidents. When we think about, you know, cross-domain solutions or multi-level security, you know, I might be looking at what are the number of integrated domains or systems, right? How do we bring those things together? How might we reduce our system integration costs? Um, you know, how long does it take to resolve cross-domain issues? Um, and making sure, of course, that our systems are compliant. When we think about, you know, worldwide research, we might think about how many active collaborations or joint projects are we enabling? Um, you know, also user satisfaction scores, right? What people experience, whether they're actually having delight in using the tools, that matters too. But we'll also be looking at, you know, hey, how much time did we take to remove, um, you know, the ability to go from kind of an idea to a project outcome. As an example, I was working with a, another organization and it had taken them kind of three years initially to get some really great artificial intelligence work off the ground. And we were able to, you know, create sandbox environments and do other things that really took about two and a half years out of that process when we went to do it the second time. And if you think about that, that's absolutely incredible. Um, when we think about capability-based investment, I, you know, we might be looking at things like, you know, what percent of our investments are aligned with our capability gaps? What is our ROI on, you know, those investments? How many new capabilities are we acquiring per year? And when we think about things like hybrid, multi-cloud, you know, things like that, we're going to be, of course, looking at cost savings. We're going to be looking at uptime and availability, but we're really going to be looking at toil reduction, right? How is it that we're making it easier than ever for people to be in the knowledge environments they need to be? You asked me a question about challenges and gosh, there's no shortage of challenges, right? Ever. I think that that there's two different ways I think about challenges. I think there's some really obvious ones, right? So part of what I have to do and part of what the team, you know, really has to do is actually communicate the value of investing in foundational areas like IT and helping people understand the solutions that we actually already have and that already exist. Um, I think also, you know, really helping move the mindset of an organization, you know, kind of from being an organization to being an organism, right? Meaning being really adaptive, really able to kind of meet the moment. And then finally, in a place like AFRL, you know, one of the amazing things is so many interesting, smart people are doing so many incredible things that how do you really bring centralized or enterprise services, you know, across a distributed or, or federated space? And how do we kind of balance alignment with autonomy, right, which is really critical when you're in a research organization. But if you step back, there's, you know, kind of a larger question as well. And so, you know, when we think about uh, not just technical barriers or people barriers, you know, there's also just, you know, policy or other requirements that can be challenging. So as an example, there was a tool that we were looking to use. And in order to use it, that tool had to be blessed, you know, by DISA for IL4 workloads. Um, you know, then they had to, you know, apply for moderate uh, FedRAMP moderate, you know, which was 12 months, then FedRAMP high, you know, another 12 months, and then ultimately applying for that IL-4 approval, which is another kind of 12 to 18 months. And really only then could we use that technology. And so I think one of the things that you know, I really want to make sure we're well positioned to do is, is how, how do we avoid giving our adversaries that kind of three to four year head start, right? And, and thinking about how we can bring these things together, you know, more quickly use to approve technologies, um, but also pioneer in a way that is really dynamic and meets the moment. There's so much to unpack here. I'm wondering, considering the work that you do, when it comes to cybersecurity, what are some of the concerns you have there? Yeah, I mean, 
I, you, you know, I joke about, you know, the fact that this role terrifies me, but yeah, that's part of what terrifies me, right? Mm. Is, is you never want to be, um, you never want to be the weak link uh, in, a, in a process like that. You know, mm. I think when I think about cyber, there's, there's a couple of things. I think I'm equally terrified by making sure we do all of the right you know, things to adhere to standards and compliance and security. Um, I think I'm also terrified by the work and the intentionality and the resources it takes to be compliant, right, with all of those types of things and, and what that means for us to really be able to thread the needle. Um, you know, I think when it comes to to cyber as well, it's, you know, it is that, that digital place of... Um, both strength and weakness, right? And vulnerability and the fact that that environment changed so quickly. And when you look, you know, when you look, for example, at a, at any type of conflict and you look at the physical space, you can see, right, what you might be responding to. And I think with digital and with cyber, um, you know, we, we can't see in the same way. And so I think I really want us to play in both an offensive and defensive position, right? I think the standards and, um, you know, all of all of the elements of zero trust and putting those things in place really help us, you know, not just on the defensive side, but on the offensive side. But I really like to see us go on offense. And I'm excited about, you know, a lot of the technologies, the partners, the services out there that are going to allow us to be kind of more aggressive than ever in that space. And I think also, as we look at tools like cloud, um, hybrid APIs and artificial intelligence, these are going to be really interesting to see how they continue to impact the cyber landscape as we move forward. But, you know, I think it, it, I think more than anything, it's a may we live in interesting times. And, you know, as a, you know, as a CIO, uh, it's wanting to do the right thing, but also making sure that the mission, um, you know, can address the needs that the mission has. So being in this early stages, who do you partner with to achieve your goals? And who do you plan on working with the future? And also, who are you learning from? Oh goodness. Um I I learn from everyone every day. That's the best part of this job, right? This is why I took this job more than anything else was to be able to stay in that kind of learner seat, right? Versus always having to to be looked at as a thought leader. I I I much rather be a thought learner. So, I think when it comes to who we're learning from or who we partner with, um the reality is there's no progress without partnership, right? And that, you know, starting with internal partners, um, one of the things I'm really excited about that uh, I did recently was we created uh, digital ally roles. And what they really do is they're stewards, they're, they're literal allies to support the technical and business leaders' visions within AFRL and kind of help them explore how digital should play a part, right? And that's often really hard because as a leader, you might know there's cool stuff out there, right? You might know about AI, you might know these things, but not really necessarily know how they're related to your work, right? Or your mission. And so bringing in and, you know, having our team really, you know, kind of be servant leaders um, right next to those types of, of leaders to say, well, what is it you're trying to do? And, and let us help you figure out where digital meets that. And so that that service mentality, I think, is really exciting. Um, and as I mentioned, the amazing thing about AFRL is that so many of the solutions that we're going to need to advance, you know, to make sure that we deploy at an enterprise level are actually being developed right now in different directorates, right? And so, you know, when smart people kind of face pain or toil, they tend to get scrappy, right? And to figure out how to solve it. And so that means that many of the cyber multi-domain security collaboration tools are actually discovered in other parts of AFRL, right? And my teams get to figure out how to quickly scale them. And one of the things I'm also really excited about is that 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 kind of behavior, that idea of learning from each other is um, really instantiated in what we call guild models, right? So, you know, the idea of, of guilds or bringing together expert and novice practitioners in areas like data, architecture, modeling, and SIM and others. And those guilds make it much faster to collectively kind of define frameworks and standards, you know, have digital catalogs, operating models, IT architecture, but more importantly, community, right, that we can learn from from each other. I think when you look external, you know, whether it's private sector, you know, tech, academia, universities, and even allied nations, 
all of those play a critical role in helping us deliver our mission for the Air Force and for Space Force. And, you know, our team's working right now to create special catalogs of products and services to make it easier for AFRL, Air Force, Space Force, and ultimately DOD to see what digital capabilities are available to them. And I'm really hoping that this also makes it easier for partners who may not have engaged with us yet to, you know, to actually highlight programs and for like researchers. And, and other groups to actually be able to find their capabilities and offerings faster. And I kind of say, stay tuned on that because I'm excited about what we'll be doing there. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm wondering uh, what your main focus is right now, what your main priorities are, and how do you see that focus shifting towards the end of the year and into the new year? Absolutely. Well, right now, uh, my focus is 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 learning right is understanding the incredible place that i've walked into the incredible work that we do so i would say the first you know priority and the focus is people right taking care of the ones i have um you know meeting the ones that i have not yet met and attracting the ones we need right the second is really trust and service so contributing to an environment that you know really reflects a spirit of service and creating trust around AFRL where, where we can really dig in and make a difference right a lot of times technology and digital has a lot of promises right and and you know I think for us, we really want to make sure that we really are are those allies. And I think there's a really, you know, interesting reason on why FRL didn't call it digital transformation, right? And instead called uh, it digital capabilities. And I think for me, that's because transformation implies that there's an endpoint, right? That there's somewhere you arrive, but really with the constant change in technology, our adversaries, there really isn't going to be a destination. There's only the goal to always be kind of a step ahead or a mile ahead or many miles ahead in the journey. And so, you know, for me, I think we focus a lot in government and defense on, on doing differently, right? We think if we tell people that this is better or this is tech is what we should use or do this instead, that they'll use it and it'll stick, right? And I think my career has really taught me that if you first change how people feel, then how they think, then the doing actually comes pretty naturally. Um, but starting with helping people feel change ready really starts with trust. So that's why the second kind of focus for me is, is to, to learn to, to, you know, and to understand and create trust so that we can actually have the digital impact that we need to on the incredible missions of you know, our fellow leaders, our defense leaders, and our national security. Yeah, and as you're settling into the role, is there anything that you look forward to most in terms of what you're working on? Oh, goodness. Um, yeah, I mean, number one, I just look forward to, you know, to helping people do research faster, right? Or just making right. life better, a little better every day. But quite frankly, I am so geeked out to see all of the new tech, not just that we have, you know, within AFRL and then the technical directorates, but actually with partners, right? I mean, what is so unique about AFRL is because we are a space that gets to lean in, you know, to the solution, not just for tomorrow, but for 10 years from now. I mean, Anastasia, I'm going to get to see some of the most amazing cutting edge technology, right, that exists and potentially partner with them. And I mean, if, if, if you are a curious person, if you're a learning person, you know, it's kind of like being a kid in a candy store, right? I mean, what an incredible mm -hmm. opportunity to not just be around the smart people that I work with every day, but really the world's smartest, you know, most creative, most curious and most cutting edge technology. You know, it's, it's just an absolute absolutely incredible place to be. Yeah, Alexis, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. And, and I hope everyone out there that has some cool stuff and, and that's things we can learn from reaches out to us. Thank you, Anastasia, for that great conversation. Listeners can tune in next week for a brand new GovCast. But until then, if you like what you heard, make sure that you're subscribed on the podcast platform of your choice. Leave a review and a five star rating and tell a friend. We always love to grow our audience. We'll see you next week. But until then, I'm Alexander Bolova. And I am Anastasia Obis. Thank you for listening.
GovCast, along with HealthCast and CyberCast, is a production of GovCIO Media and Research. For more podcasts and to check out the other shows, head to govciomedia.com. Watch out for new episodes released every Tuesday and Wednesday across our shows. You can follow all of them on your favorite podcast platform. And if you like what you heard, make sure to let us know by leaving a review. And if you have any topics you think we should look into, contact us at newsletter at govcio.com.